Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. Thank you all for coming to this uh, I3T evening meeting. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, um, I'm Bok Sun Kim. I'm the chair of the um, Institution of Structural Engineers, Devon and um, Cornell Regional Group. Um, we have a register here. Um, I would appreciate if you could write down um, your name and your grade and your organization. Before we start this evening meeting, I have a um, notice. Um, as you know that we need to submit our CPD uh, every year. The Sunday, March 31st, is the deadline. So if you haven't done your CPD for last year, so please do so by this Sunday. As you know, we have a theme of space engineering uh, this year. So. Um, in February, we hosted a talk um, on the final frontier, uh, the challenges of the final frontier uh, by De <coughs> Professor Dave Southwood, uh, which was well attended. And this evening, we have a second talk on this theme. Um, we have Dr. Mike McCulloch uh, from, from the University of Primus. Uh, Dr. Mike McCulloch is a lecturer uh, in geomatics uh, geomatics is the mathematics of positioning in space. Um, he has a BSc in physics and a PhD in ocean physics and worked as an ocean scientist at the Met Office for 10 years. In 2007, he proposed a theory, uh, quantized inertia, and wrote a book, um, Physics from the Edge, shown on the screen in 2014. And last November, he gave a talk, um, he gave a TEDx talk uh, at the University of Plymouth. Ever since he proposed his theory, um, he has been in trouble with the physics community and beyond. So he's very keen to make um, friends with pragmatic engineers like us. So hence, he's here. So he's going to talk about horizon engineering this evening and also his recent grant success of $1.3 million um, from the DAFA, from the US, um, from the US Defense Advanced um, Research Projects Agency. So ladies and gentlemen, um, please welcome Dr. Mike McCulloch. Well, hello, thanks for inviting me uh, to talk today. Um, so my, my subject is going to be horizon engineering, and I'm going to try and explain what that means uh, to join the talk. Okay. Um, so the contents of the talk, uh, I'm going to break it down like this. I'm going to try and convince you that some astrophysical data we have uh, suggests that we need uh, new physics. I'm going to propose that that new physics is quantized inertia. And I'm going to show you how it gets rid of dark matter and dark energy. It's a way to do that. And then I'm going to talk about uh, potential applications of this, focusing on electric rockets, a way to, a way to launch spacecraft without uh, chemical rockets. I'll talk briefly about other future possibilities like hovering buildings and vacuum energy. And I'll talk about what DARPA are asking me to do and concludes. So, I thought before I go, go into the astrophysics and all the theory, I thought I would uh, make it clear that I'm, my ultimate goal is an application, um, something that can be used in an engineering sense. Um, so, these applications might be as follows. So, at the moment we use chemical rockets, um, even the very uh, new SpaceX use, use chemical, chemical rockets which are expensive, heavy, dangerous, they, they can explode, they cost uh, many millions of, of dollars. It would be uh, much better to uh, use a, uh, a smoother system, so I'm going to suggest one, something more like, um, like this that can hover without um, making a lot of uh, noise. Also, I'm going to suggest ways far in the future that this same idea might be used to convert our kind of building into something that would float. 
and also talk very briefly about a way to use this, this idea to generate energy. So horizon engineering, I, in a brief sentence, I define this as the ability to move objects or generate power by putting horizons into the quantum vacuum. I'll try and explain how, how we might do that. Um, so it's not standard physics, it's, it's new physics, and I understand the difficulty in suggesting that. Um, but physics is, is certainly not complete. If you look at it in a particular way, uh, you can say that if you look at what standard physics can actually predict without an arbitrary input, you could say that it could predict about 4 or 5% of what appears to be out in the cosmos. Um, and the rest of it is unknown and can be uh, modeled using dark matter and dark energy, but um, they're less than ideal. So I suppose the, the main uh, anomaly that started me off was galaxy rotation. So this is a, uh, a typical galaxy. It's the Andromeda galaxy, our closest neighbor. Uh, stars spin around, center. and. Uh, astronomers for many years have looked at galaxies like this, and Fritz Spicke, as shown here, in 1933, um, and also more recently Vera Rubin, who looked specifically at galaxies, not galaxy clusters, noticed that if you take a star near the edge and calculate how fast it's moving, then the centrifugal force, the inertial force on it, should be enough to uh, throw it off into space. It's the gravitational force holding it in from all the visible matter appears to be far too small. Uh, so this is the gravitational uh, gravity, uh, uh, the galaxy rotation problem. So galaxies should, should fly apart inertially, but they, they don't. They appear to be nice round, round systems. So the, the standard technique for solving this problem is to say that, OK, there must be some matter in the galaxies that we can't see. And uh, this is, of course, called dark matter. And this is added to the galaxies um, uh, semi-arbitrarily semi uh, to make the theory predict the correct rotation rate. Um, but the problem with it, well, at least in my view, is that it's, it's, it's arbitrary and it has to be adjusted to fit every galaxy and you have to put it in wherever you need it to make the theory fit. So it seems to be not following the scientific method. Uh, so what I'm going to suggest <coughs> instead is something that has no arbitrary component at all. So for quite a long time, about 13 years, I've been thinking about inertia and inertial mass. So inertia is a tendency of objects to keep going in a straight line unless you, you push on them. And a good example would be this, um, the ladder on top of this lorry when it crashes into the car. The ladder continues to, to move forward because of its inertial mass. So inertial mass is not due to the Higgs field. Uh, well, part of it is supposedly due to the Higgs field, but this only explains the mass of the, the quarks. Uh, which are very, when the quarks combine to form particles, uh, you get more mass, about a thousand times more. So uh, the Higgs mechanism can only explain about 0.01%, sorry, 0.1% of uh, inertial mass. And inertia has never been understood, really. It's, um, we, we assume that things will keep going forward in a straight line at constant speed until pushed on. But the question is, why is that uh, the case? So I'll try and show you a mechanism that might that, that can do that. Um, so I'm going to propose that inertia, inertia arises from both relativity, which provides horizons, and quantum mechanics, which provides the quantum vacuum. Okay, so just a bit of theoretical background. There's something called the, uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, uh, which is shown here, which says that the uncertainty momentum times the uncertainty position must be bigger than that particular number, a constant. So this means that if, as you reduce the uncertainty in position, if you look at smaller and smaller regions of space, uh, more and more virtual particles, uh, there's more energy or momentum in that particular space. So um, a perfect vacuum on the smaller scales would be full of particles, particle pairs forming and re recombining. And as is usual with quantum mechanics, they're associated with um, the Broglie waves or De Broglie waves. So 
this sounds uh, slightly crazy, but it does seem to exist. And the proof, although this is, this is still debated, um, is the Casimir effect. Hendrik Casimir in 1948, he said, okay, if this vacuum exists, then if these vacuum particles exist, then all you have to do is put two conducting plates in the vacuum. And then what will happen is that outside the plates, any old wave will do. Any old wave can exist. But between the plates, only waves that have a node at the boundary can exist, like this one here. Uh, this wave, which is not, does not have a node at the boundary, would cause electrons in the conductor to move about and cancel the field. Um, so that means that, for example, this wave or particle will disappear in this one too. So this means you have more virtual particles outside the plates than inside. So you get more of a push from the outside in than you do from the inside out. So you get what's called a Casimir force, which pushes the plates together. And this has been well measured um, to a few percent of accuracy. Uh, so it seems that the vacuum, um, the quantum vacuum, does exist. OK, so the, the vacuum is a bit like a, a sea, a very energetic sea that we, we can't see. So in order to introduce the model, I'm going to use an analogy using um, a more familiar kind of sea. Uh, the, the ocean. So imagine you have a ship at a dock, close to a dock. Out at sea, there'll be lots of waves, and they'll hit the ship and push it inwards. Between the ship and the dock, uh, you won't have as many, <coughs> partly because of sheltering, but also because only certain waves can exist. So this wave will be able to um, uh, remain between the ship and the dock, because the water is not moving here or here. It's not moving up and down, so there's no friction. But a different kind of wave would, would be damped. So you would have fewer waves between the ship and the dock, and that means more waves will hit it from this side and this side, and it will move towards the dock. OK, so in order to translate this into um, uh, physics, I have to explain what a horizon is. Um, this is another kind of uh, dock or wall that I'm going to use. Um, so imagine that this is me speaking in this lecture, and you're quite shocked by what I'm saying, and so you accelerate away very fast, maybe you get in a jet plane or something. If that's the case, then you will not hear the sound that's coming out of my mouth, because you'll be going faster than the speed of sound. Uh, so you could then say, I, I would be behind an acoustic horizon for you. Um, so a horizon is a, a, boundary, a boundary to what you can know about, about the universe. Um, so it applies to sound, and it also applies to light. So I suppose the most famous kind of horizon is the black hole event horizon. So if we have a lot of mass in a very small space, we get a black hole. And then you get a black hole event horizon surrounding it because light cannot escape. So you can never know what's inside this particular, this particular area. And Stephen Hawking up here, um, of course, became famous for questioning what would happen if two of these <coughs> particles were to be emitted directly on the boundary of the, um, of the horizon directly on the horizon. So one particle would go out, one would go in to conserve momentum. But the one that went into the black hole would disappear from the point of view of somebody outside. That was supposed to disappear there, but it didn't. So if this one's gone inside and disappeared, then this one would not be able to recombine with it, so it would be released as Hawking radiation. Then, about simultaneously, Bill Unru from Canada uh, he said a similar thing would happen to an accelerating spaceship. If the spaceship is accelerating in, uh, to the right, then light from this area will never be able to catch up with it. So there will be another horizon here, a dynamical one. It's now called a Rindler horizon. Um, so similarly, if you have two virtual particles emitted on the horizon, the one that goes in will be lost, and the one that remains outside will be emitted as Unruh radiation. So that's Unruh radiation. <coughs> and I'm going to try and make inertial mass out of Unruh radiation. Uh, but first of all, has Unruh radiation been seen? Uh, well, uh, perhaps is the answer. It's generally extremely difficult to see it. The wavelength of it is given by 8 times the speed of light squared, which is a huge number, about 10 to the 17, <coughs> divided by the acceleration of the object that's um, looking. 
Um, and I, I should also make it clear that unknown radiation is only seen by an object that's ex accelerating. If another object is not accelerating as, and is in the same space, it will not see the radiation at all. So it's a very strange kind of radiation. So unknown waves, unknown wavelengths for the kind of accelerations we see on the Earth at 9.8 meters per second per second will be about seven light years long, which are very difficult to detect. But in certain experiments, you, uh, you should be able to see them. And one of them is an experiment done by Bevers Lewis back in 1994, where they had a, a gold nanotip, a radius of curvature about 0.23 nanometers. They shone a laser on it, and they watched the plasmons propagate around the, the very sharp tip at a very high speed. And this was a huge acceleration, and they uh, detected a difference in the light being emitted that was consistent with unknown radiation. And this is all explained in a paper by uh, Smolny Ninov in uh, 2005. But this is highly contested, of course, but this could be the first observation of um, unknown radiation. Okay, so I'm now going to use this to try and explain inertial mass. Um, so here's an object. It's accelerating to the right. And relativity forms a horizon behind it. This information from this area cannot catch up. So just like the ship and the dock, here on this side of it, it sees lots of unknown waves. Um, because any wave can, <coughs> can form, any wavelength can exist. On this side, only a few are the ones that fit between the object and the horizon. So more virtual particles will bump into the object from this side and fewer from this side. So it'll be pushed back against whatever acceleration it had. I managed to show in a paper in 2013 that this predicts inertial mass. It predicts what we know as inertial mass. Um, so it, it tells us, uh, perhaps for the first time, uh, why we have inertia, why things do not like to accelerate. Um, explains that at a deeper level. So recently, I've, I've got a postdoc, and he's done a simulation of this. This is just to show you um, that it, the simulation agrees. Uh, here's a particle accelerating to the right. It forms a Rindler horizon. And you can see this is the electromagnetic unruh field. Um, and there are more unruh waves in front than behind. And this will uh, provide a, a back uh, force backwards. But that's not quite, um, first of all, that's not particularly interesting because um, it's never good to, to predict something you know exists in the first place. Uh, we all know that the initial mass is there. Uh, what's, what's really nice is to try and predict anomalies that, <coughs> new anomalies that have been seen. Um, and there is another kind of horizon, uh, the Hubble horizon. So if, if we're in the center of the cosmos here, as you look further and further away, the stars are moving away from us faster and faster. So eventually they move away at the speed of light, and then you have something called the Hubble horizon, or the cosmic, <coughs> cosmic horizon, where they're moving at the speed of light, and you can't see them. So if you add this into the mix, then it means that there's also a horizon on this side of the object, which will damp some of these, these waves. It will get rid of some of them. So I've shown one of the waves is now dotted here. Um, but if the object has a very low acceleration, the unruh waves will get longer, and more of them will be damped by this cosmic horizon. Um, so if I kind of summarize that, oh, and I, I described this model actually before the first one in 2007, uh, 2007 in a paper here. Um, so for high acceleration, you get an object accelerating to the left. It sees unruh wa waves in front of it. The ones behind it are damped by this horizon. So feels a push back against its acceleration. If it's accelerating very slowly to the left, the unknown waves are so large that they're damped symmetrically around the particle by the Hubble horizon. So this mechanism, uh, which I've called the ACE mechanism or asymmetric Casimir effect, um, disappears. <coughs> so what we're familiar with as inertial mass should not exist for very low accelerations. But this is really good because the problem with galaxies also occurs, always <coughs> occurs, at their edges. So physics is fine in the center, but as soon 
as you get to a particular radius, the stars are accelerating so slow, and that's where the problems begin. It seems to fit <coughs> really well. And I'll, I'll show you in a minute that when you apply uh, quantized inertia, this new model, the initial centrifugal force on the star is reduced so that it exactly equals the gravitational force from the visible matter. Um, and this can be done with, in the, in the model, only the visible mass, the speed of light, and the Hubble scale. There's nothing else in the model. So I'll just show you the equation that um, I, I tend to use. So the theory predicts that the modified inertial mass is equal to the, the normal one times a factor 1 minus 2c squared over the acceleration of the, the object times the Hubble diameter. Um, so the first thing you might notice is that this is very simple, and everything in here is, uh, is detectable or known. So we know the speed of light. We know the Hubble diameter from the, the Hubble constant. We know the acceleration of the object we're looking at. Uh, so there's no way it can be tuned. Um, so if you put this formula into Newton's second law, and the gravity law, you get this result. And uh, it predicts a, um, uh, an acceleration, which is the usual one of gravity, uh, the usual formula for gravity, plus a constant term. So the first good thing about this, this new term is that it's independent of mass. So it means the equivalence principle is still valid um, in the theory. Um, so if Galileo do drops two balls off the Tower of Pisa, they'll still land uh, together. Because this term is independent of mass. But they will land slightly quicker, quicker than you would expect. Um, the second thing is this is um, equal to the acceleration, the cosmic acceleration that's been seen, well, I suppose, inferred right at the edge of the, the cosmos. Um, so uh, in a sense, it gets rid of dark energy is it predicts a minimum acceleration, which is equal to the one that we see. I'll show you some galaxy data now. Uh, so this shows a set of galaxy data from 153 galaxies <coughs> in the Spark catalog. <coughs> I got the data from um, Professor McGough in America. And it shows, the graph shows the expected acceleration along here, and the observed acceleration of galaxies up here. Um, so the expected acceleration is, of course, from Newton or general relativity. And if it was correct, you would see all the gray squares, which represent the data, along this line. Um, but they're all shifted up for low accelerations, which is the galaxy rotation anomaly. Very low accelerations, the galaxies are spinning too fast. There's another theory called MOND, that some of you may have heard of, which predicts the, the, <coughs> solid, the solid line here. And it agrees with the data. But to do it, you have to tune it. You have to put in a, a number that is arbitrary. Um, quantized inertia predicts a dashed line, so it predicts the data without any arbitrary tuning. In fact, it predicts the, the constant you have to put into MON by itself. OK, so I published that in this paper here. OK. Um, but the problem, of course, is that um, it's possible to, to also fit this, all this data with dark matter. You just take each galaxy, you work out which, what dark matter you need, you put it in, and you can, you can predict all, all these. Um, so what is needed, really, is a test that cannot be solved by, by dark matter. Um, so I've been looking recently at wide binaries. Uh, so these are stars, pairs of stars that are bound together gravitationally. Um, but very far apart, over 7,000 AU apart. And they accelerate very slowly, so they should, they should show an anomalous dynamics. Um, and they do. It's been found by Hernandez et al., 2017, that they do show anomalous dynamics. They spin too fast, they orbit too fast. Um, the great thing about these is that dark matter cannot be added to correct them. Because in order to model galaxies, dark matter has, they've had to invent new physics so that dark matter stays spread out over large scales. You can't then suddenly pack it into a very small space in between two wide binaries without making dark matter even more exotic. Um, so this is a great test um, because dark matter cannot, uh, cannot be used. So I've looked at the data. 
This shows the separation of the wide binary. This shows the orbital speed, kilometers per second, and the data is the crosses. Uh, so <clears throat> dark matter is already out. You can't explain this. Uh, Newton is the blue curve here with the error bars shown by the, the two, uh, two, two lines there. So Newton is obviously falsified uh, beyond about uh, this, this point, um, 22 parsecs or so. Uh, Mond is also very, very similar because it suffers from something called the external field effect. So it's very similar to Newton, actually. Uh, but quantized inertia is shown here. And given the uncertainty, it, it agrees with the data. So the uncertainty in the data is this, <coughs> this gray envelope. So this is a very, very nice test in that it shows that only quantized inertia can predict these wide binaries. Uh, dark matter, Mond, Newton, they, they can't do it. Um, so um, myself and my postdoc, um, uh, Dr. Lucio, we've submitted a paper on this to astrophysics and space science. So that should come out soon because it's been provisional, provisionally accepted. To show you a, a simulation now, which shows two of these wide binaries. Um, this is produced by Dr. Lucio, my postdoc. Uh, so you can see the two stars. And the simulation is going to apply Newton, um, the blue curve, Mond, and QI, quantized inertia, to the white binaries to see which one um, works. Because white binaries should be bound. Um, so see that Newton and Mond, the stars zoom away, but with quantized inertia, they stay, they stay bound. Nice test. Okay, so over the over the years, I've been mean, comparing quantized inertia to quite a lot of anomalies, and I won't go through all of these, but they range from things like the cosmic acceleration down through galaxy rotation, down to things like the flyby anomaly. Uh, the great thing about it is that it can it offers an explanation for inertial mass, which we didn't have before, gets rid of dark matter and dark energy, and it uses both quantum mechanics and relativity. You know, OK, so the, the difficulty with, with this, the best way to test a theory is to do it in the lab, so to bring it down to a lab scale. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do now. Presumably, if we, we understand inertia, we can, we can start to control it in a new way. Um, for example, if you take an acceleration core, spin an object very fast, the acceleration will be very high. So the under waves it sees will be very short. Um, and they might be short enough to be damped by some kind of technology that, we, that we're familiar with, for example, conductors, um, simple plate conductors or metamaterials. Um, if you do that, then the object will see under waves coming from all directions except this one where they're damped, and then it should move, move in response. And this will be a new, a new way to move things. Um, so, uh, this may seem very outlandish, but in a very small sense, it's been seen before uh, with the Casimir effect. Um, so, you have these two plates, you have uh, the quantum vacuum outside, less quantum vacuum inside, so they get pushed together. Imagine what would happen, just as a thought experiment, if you had a, a V shaped plate like this, then you would have more waves outside here, they would be damped inside, so there'd be a force on the plates like this and it would move in this direction. And then now if, imagine what would happen if you were somehow able to energize the vacuum inside the V, it would now see a force like that and be a component in this direction. Um, well, something like that may have been seen, but this is also very controversial. Um, this was, um, this is the M drive, so this is an anomaly that was discovered around about 2001 by a British engineer, uh, Roger Scheuer. And he found, um, after many years in the satellite industry, that if he um, took a copper truncated cone, this kind of shape, he put, he used magnetrons to put microwaves inside so that they resonated and bounced around inside a lot, then there was a tiny thrust 
incredibly tiny but detectable towards the narrow end of the, uh, the drive. Um, so when I, I found out about this, I was obviously interested to see whether I could predict it. And I should say that it still could be an experimental error. Um, so the M drive has not, has been, the force has also been measured by NASA, um, but it could be an experimental error. So no one has yet pointed out exactly what error it might be. So, so the way that quantized inertia explains this is by um, the microwaves inside the cavity are moving around very fast. So they're accelerating very fast. So the only waves they see should be, according to the theory, um, short enough that they can interact with the, the conducting walls of the, the cavity. And if that is the case, then the narrow end of the cavity will damp more of the waves than the, the wide end. So you'll see more on the waves at this end than at this end, so there'll be a gradient, and the cavity should slowly fall down the, the gradient. Um, so you should get a thrust in that direction as it's seen. So the theory predicts that you should get a force equal to uh, this, so that's six times the power input in watts times the quality factor of the cavity, so that's how many times the microwaves are able to bounce around in the cavity before dissipating as heat. Um, L is the length, speed of light, NB and NS, this is the refractive index of the big end and the small end, and this is the width of the big and small end. And uh, this shows all the experimental data I have so far, so these are all the tests. Shoya's first test in 2001, right through to NASA's um, most recent one in 2016. And the observed thrusts <coughs> are shown here in millinewtons, <coughs> and the predicted one is shown from quantized inertia is shown there. So, unfortunately, the first thing you notice is the first value is about the right size, but the wrong sign. Um, so, that's interesting, but it's... This could be because I've misunderstood Shoya's paper. He's... Um, he sometimes uh, is confused between thrust and acceleration, so I need to ask him about that. But if you look at the other ones, the numbers are fairly, fairly similar. The latest test is probably the best one, because that was published in a mainstream journal, and uh, the result is fairly good. So, so I've been talking about launching things. Is the M-Drive uh, launchable? Well, the short answer is no. Um, it, it produces a force, but it's very small. So, for example, if you had a solar panel up here with a mass of about 20 kilograms and an output of 1.25 watts, this is a, a typical solar, solar panel of this weight, um, and an M-drive of mass 10 kilograms, then you'll have this many newtons acting downwards. And the M-drive provides about 0.147 newtons per kilowatt of power input which is quite a small <coughs> force. Um, so the force upwards is only about 0.04 newtons, so it's, uh, it's about 0.01% of its weight, which isn't going to launch anything, obviously. Um, but um, it's, it's a start, and I'll describe in a few moments how we could enhance this. Um, just to tell you a few of the applications, <coughs> if we're able to um, get this to work. The first immediate one is satellite station keeping. Um, satellites, obviously open space, they tend to fall down uh, because of atmospheric friction. And it would be very useful to have a, a thruster that you're able to put on them, which uses solar power, which is able to boost them. It doesn't need fuel. Um, also, it'd be um, much easier to launch satellites like that, it'd be lighter. A potential military application is silent orbital maneuvering. Um, Normally, when uh, a state changes the orbit of a satellite, it has to fire a rocket, um, and this can be seen by the um, by the other, by other states. So this kind of thruster would be, be silent. It's also um, well I'll discuss this this later, I, but quite obvious are things like flying cars, new kinds of aircraft, structures that hover, better ways to launch things, and also interstellar trips become possible for the first time because. 
um, it is possible to get to Alpha Centauri, for example, if you're able to go at about 90% the speed of light. So you can, um, uh, you can use time dilation and reduce the trip for you to about five years. Um, but of course, in order to get to 0 0.9, 0 0.9 times the speed of light, you need as much fuel as a small planet. Um, with this kind of thruster, you wouldn't need the fuel, um, just an energy source. Um, so uh, perhaps the reasons that are obvious, I was, I was contact contacted by, by DARPA in the US. Uh, so this is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And they're charged by the Americans with making sure that America doesn't have another Sputnik moment. In about 1957, the Americans were sh quite shocked when they met, um, the Russians launched Sputnik 1. And they felt they were behind the game technologically. So they, they set up DARPA to make sure this never happens again, that they are always um, in tune with the latest developments and always ahead of the, uh, the opposition. Uh, so uh, they made contact with me, and I applied for funding. And I, I got $1.3 million of it. And they want me to do two things. The first is to make quantized inertia more predictive. So uh, they want a computer model that predicts um, for a particular cavity or uh, structure and a particular acceleration, what thrust, <coughs> what thrust you might expect to get. And the second one is to demonstrate the capability to counter gravity or, or launch. And this doesn't mean that they're um, expecting me to start launching things <coughs> in a few years' time. Uh, this just means that I, uh, well, what I'd like to be able to do is to demonstrate in the lab that uh, we can produce thrust that is scalable. So thrust that you're able to enhance enough to affect launch, um, or at least decent propulsion in space. Uh, so that's what the project involves. The project, project is entitled Propellantless Propulsion from Quantized Inertia. And I've set up a team. So at the University of Plymouth, there's, there's obviously me. And I've hired a, a postdoc, Jesus Lucio, uh, who is uh, very good at computer modeling, as you've seen. And we're going to be in charge of the, the theory aspect of the program. At Dresden, I happen to know Martin Timar, who I've invited to join. He's very good at um, measuring thrust from iron, iron thrusters, uh, which are um, a new kind of thruster, which are very, which are very similar. Um, and in Spain, I've got an experimental team, um, Professor Perez Diaz, uh, who are looking at a different experiment. So the project has three parts to it. So the first 18 months in Plymouth, we're building a fully predictive model of QI using console, uh, multi-physics. And the Dresden and Madrid groups are building experiments. And I'll show you what those experiments are in a minute. Then for the next period, which is about 12 months long, Dresden and Madrid will be testing for our thrust signal. And we'll be refining the model. And then the last 18 months, we're hoping to use a model to work out how to enhance whatever thrust we've seen. And if we don't see any thrust, <coughs> the, the project will end uh, somewhere around here. Um, OK, so the experiment in Madrid looks like this. Um, what they've done is they've got a fiber optic with this kind of shape. They've wound it around on a, a spool. And they're putting a laser in about 0.1 watts. And it's very similar in shape to the M drive. The idea is that on this side, there'll be more onward waves, fewer damped. On this narrow choke point, there'll be fewer onward waves, so there'll be a force, uh, force this way. And the, the theory predicts a force of about one micronewton, which is very small, but it can be found, uh, can be detected. And uh, recently, they've, they've started coming up with a few, a few results. They've actually detected some, some thrust coming out. <coughs> but it's extremely tentative, and there's an awful lot of noise in, in the system. So. Um, but there may be some thrust of between 1 and 4 micronewtons, but we're not, we're not sure about that yet. Just to show you, this is the, the plot they sent me. This is um, the peak 
that, that shows thrust, but as you can see, there are lots of other peaks as well, so um, we need to reduce the noise in the experiment uh, quite a lot. Um, so how can we enhance this thrust? I'm leading up to the Dresden team now. The predictive formula for thrust from quantized inertia for all of these kind of drives is that the force you get out is proportional to the, the power you put in in watts, the quality factor of the cavity, so how many times the photons and microwaves bounce back, backwards and forwards, to put it simply, and the speed of light. Um, so there are several ways to enhance the thrust. You could do it by trying to boost the power in, but the problem there is heat. Um, in order to get the M drive to levitate, for example, you would have to put 1.2 megawatts into the cavity, which would melt it very quickly. Um, the other way to do it is to reduce the speed of light, which would boost the force. So a dielectric could be used in the cavity to do that. That might boost the thrust. Uh, possibly the best way to do it is to boost the Q, the quality factor of the, the cavity. So for the M-drive, you could use a superconducting, um, uh, uh, superconducting M-drive, which would have a higher Q, but that's very difficult to do. Uh, the other way to do it is to use light. And um, this guy, Travis Taylor, read my papers, and he wrote a paper in 2017 saying that quantized inertia implies that an M-drive using visible light would have a 1,000 times the effectiveness, the thrust. Um, and the reason is that mirrors are so good these days. You can get things called super mirrors that uh, have incredible optics and have very, very small losses. Um, so this is his idea for a light M drive. You have a, a convex mirror here, con sorry, a concave one here, a convex one there. And the light, laser light bounces around in a, a gain medium here. And it should, be, should produce about a thousand times the thrust. And he published a paper on this in 2017. So, and this is slightly better. So if you look at the, uh, what you might call the Taylor drive, this is the, the light in drive of the solar panel. Taylor drive provides about, <coughs> well, it should provide about 200 newtons per kilowatt. Um, and if you've got 0.25 kilowatts from a decent solar panel, you've got a force of about 50 newtons, which, uh, which is a significant amount of the weight. And you could see that from this, you could perhaps uh, enhance it further. Um, but we're getting close to um, launch capability. <coughs> so yes, I should also say that in Dresden, they are now building this, uh, this thing. So they're going to test it. Um, possibly by the end of this year. So there are other ways to, to do this, though. Other possible experiments involve building structures a bit like this one. So this is um, a conductive structure that has a large, um, uh, it's not so complicated down here, but has far more elements up here. The idea is that you, uh, you accelerate this, you spin it to produce short under waves. And then these other waves are more damped by this part of the structure from the bottom, so there's a force upwards. Another possible experiment is to use a spark. So this is a capacitor. Um, it's one plate, there's another plate. And it's asymmetric, so one plate is bigger, thicker than the other one. <coughs> then if you um, produce a spark in it, what happens is you'll see short on the waves because of the high electron acceleration more on the waves at this side than this side, so it should see a force in this direction. And this has actually been, <coughs> been seen by some experiments in California by somebody called James, James Woodward. And another way to do it is to have an S shape with an axle. If you produce a shape like this, there should be more on the waves outside this, the shape than inside these cavities, and so it might be able to rotate if you built this on a small enough scale. <coughs> So I'll, I'll summarize. Um, so I proposed this model called quantized inertia. It explains inertia for the first time. It takes elements from relativity and quantum mechanics, gets rid of dark matter and dark energy, and it predicts a, a horizon drive, or you might call an electric rocket. 
I suppose the simple statement is of quantized inertia that all movement is caused by horizons in the quantum vacuum. Because um, I've been looking at gravity this way as well. Um, and it may be possible to design structures that tap into this uh, spec. That's the hope. So thanks so much. And any questions? How would you get directional control into something that you'd launched? At, I mean, I, I can imagine it sort of going off like a bullet and in one particular direction. But how would you be able to sort of tweak it as you went along? <coughs> yes, interesting question. Um, well, you, if you had something like the M drive, you can have a dielectric in one end of it, and then you could move that dielectric around within the structure and it would tend to move towards the, where the dielectric was. <coughs> so you can do it that way. So it's always bothered me on Star Trek where they go into warp factor three, Mr. Sulu, and the thing just sort of disappears in a straight line. I think, well, what the hell if, if there's something in the way? <laughs> Make a big hole in something. The accelerations we expect to get at the moment are much smaller than that, so. lensing of light. So, so going back to the galaxy stuff, um, then obviously you see uh, gravitational lensing from, say, galaxies or galaxy clusters that nominally tells you something about mass. <clears throat> normally that's then attributed to dark matter. So I'm just a bit confused about what lensing results mean if the dark matter in the galaxy doesn't exist. The, the theory predicts that light should be affected in just the same way as matter. So it predicts that light will bend around matter in a way that's, um, that's consistent with the, the lensing data. So I haven't published a paper on that yet. Um, okay. Very recently I've been working on trying to reproduce the, um, the bending of light by the sun predicted by general relativity. I, I think I can do that as well, without a bending of space. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure about that. So, so light doesn't have mass. Well, it doesn't have rest. I've, I've had this debate a lot. Um, it doesn't have rest mass, but my contention is that it has inertial mass. So it pushes solar sails. So. Yeah. Yeah. That basis, you've got something accelerating. It might be creating energy, and therefore there must be a balancing energy. Where does it go? Yes, that's that's a good question. Um, the I don't know if you've heard of Landauer's principle. Okay. Uh, uh, well, Landauer's principle says that you can get energy from information. And this has been proven in computers when you when you erase a hard disk or something, you uh, get rid of information and you produce heat. So there's a link between energy and information. And when you form a, a Rindler horizon, you delete information about the universe behind the horizon. So you get energy. <laughs> that, that's the idea. such small accelerations in four, you, you, there was a slide where you had millinewtons and I suppose that's based, that was for a satellite was it? Uh, uh, so, okay, there, was, there was a measured force of millinewtons, not, my, not that one, the one before that. Mike, before that. Right. I'm just wondering how you measure such small values. 
Are these okay? Um, yes, use a torsion balance. Uh, so they have um, uh, two masses on a, an axle like this, and the end drive is here. There's a neutral mass here, and then you, can, uh, you cut out gravity, and it's, it's only moving in a horizontal direction. So it can measure very small forces. No, it could be fairly, fairly quick. People are, are already thinking about launching M drives into space to, to test them. So that could be the first step. The first application will be satellite station keeping. So launch a satellite with an engine on it and see, see if it manages to stay up longer than expected. Um, so how quick can we have this one? Well, I'd say it could be a few, a few years, but only a few, few years.